At the heart of Christian theology is the idea that a man named Jesus suffered a horrible death in order to save us from our sins, and that his death is what allowed his Father, the creator of the universe, to forgive humanity for our evil thoughts and actions. The death of Jesus was not an accident. Jesus had to die to save us from our sins. Or did he? The question I'd like to explore today is, why did Jesus have to die? Why did the all-powerful and all-loving God of Christianity need to brutally murder someone? What goal of God's could not have been achieved without torturing Jesus to death? There is, of course, a large body of answers to this question, so today I'd like to go through the most common ones and to explain why they don't work. Number 1. A sacrifice for sins. The explanation that Jesus was a sacrifice is perhaps the most common explanation for why Jesus had to die. And it's not hard to see why. Throughout the Old Testament, people offered sacrifices to God to apologize for their sins. And so, the explanation goes, God sent Jesus to be the ultimate sacrifice, the final sacrifice, for all of humanity's sins. When we look at the Old Testament, we see that there was a sacrificial system that was in place. And that sacrificial system ultimately pointed to the Lord Jesus Christ, the only one, the Lamb of God, who could fulfill the law and be an acceptable sacrifice on behalf of our sins. Jesus saw his death as an expiatory sacrifice to God, akin to the animal sacrifices in the Old Testament that were offered in the tabernacle. Jesus thought of his death as an expiatory sacrifice which uh, cleansed the world of its sin and thereby reconciled them to God. But there's a problem. God doesn't actually need a sacrifice in order to forgive people. God forgives people without a sacrifice many times in the Old Testament. In Psalm 78, verses 36 through 39, God simply forgives people who sinned against him. No sacrifice required. Hosea 6.6 6 says that God desires steadfast love and not sacrifice. 2 Chronicles 7.14 says that God will forgive his people's sins if they simply turn from their wicked ways and seek him. And Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8 specifically says that sacrifice is not required and that all you need to do is follow God. Shall I come before the Lord with burnt offerings, thousands of rams, my firstborn child? No. The Lord requires nothing but that you do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with him. It's also worth pointing out that Jesus forgave people's sins without requiring a sacrifice. And if Jesus really is God, then this reinforces the fact that God doesn't actually need a sacrifice in order to forgive people. So why does God suddenly need a human sacrifice now? He could simply forgive us, without a sacrifice, as he has done before. A sacrifice is clearly not required for forgiveness, which means that Jesus did not have to die. In fact, as the cherry on top, Jesus instructed us to forgive each other with no sacrifice which we seem perfectly capable of doing. If we can do it, if we can forgive each other without a sacrifice, why can't God? Are we more forgiving than God? Did Jesus command us to do something that contradicts God's nature? There doesn't seem to be a clear way to resolve this. At this point, an apologist might argue that while a sacrifice is not necessary for an apology, it is still a powerful way to show just how sorry you are, which I think is a fair point. If I, for example, wanted to show you how sorry I was for something I did, if I wanted to show you how much I value your forgiveness, I might, for example, smash my fancy PC. This would demonstrate that I value your forgiveness more than I value my fancy PC. Archaic though this action might be, it would certainly send a very powerful message about how sorry I am and how much I value your forgiveness. But there's a catch. The mere fact that something gets destroyed or killed doesn't necessarily make it a sacrifice. After all, 
things break all the time, and animals die every day, but we don't consider these to be sacrifices. It seems to me that you can only call the destruction of something a sacrifice if the following conditions apply. Number one, you destroy something that belongs to you. Number two, you destroy something that you value. Number three, you destroy something intentionally. Number four, you lose the thing being destroyed for at least a very long time, if not forever. Number five, you choose to destroy something rather than the thing choosing to destroy itself. And number six, you destroy something after you wrong someone, not preemptively. To illustrate the importance of these conditions, let's return to the example of sacrificing my fancy PC, and let's change it slightly. What if, instead of destroying my PC to show you how sorry I am, I destroyed my neighbor's PC? Would that still be a meaningful sacrifice? Would that still show you how sorry I am? Probably not so much. What if I instead destroyed my own PC, but it was completely worthless to me? Would that be a meaningful sacrifice? What if I did value my PC, but I accidentally destroyed it? Would that be a meaningful sacrifice? What if I intentionally destroyed my PC, but I knew full well that it would reassemble itself in a few hours? Would that be a meaningful sacrifice? What if my PC freely chose to destroy itself one day because it knew that I was sorry? Would that be a meaningful sacrifice? And finally, what if I destroyed my PC before I even met you? Would that be a meaningful sacrifice? Would that show you just how sorry I am? No, it wouldn't show you how sorry I am. It wouldn't be a sacrifice at all. So how does this apply to the death of Jesus? Well, let's go down the list. Jesus did not belong to the Romans or the Jews. The Romans and the Jews did not value Jesus. Quite the opposite. The Romans and the Jews did not intend to sacrifice Jesus as an apology. Jesus was not lost forever or even for a long time. He came back to life. Jesus chose to sacrifice himself. And finally, Jesus was sacrificed before anyone alive and sinning today was even born. As you can clearly see, even if we take Christianity at face value, Jesus' sacrifice as an apology to God makes no sense. Not only does God not actually require a sacrifice to forgive people, but even if he did, or even if it was simply a nice gesture, the circumstances around Jesus' death completely undercut the idea that it was a sacrifice. The death of Jesus might be superficially similar to a sacrifice, insofar as something died, but when you actually consider what a sacrifice is, and when you consider the fact that God doesn't even need a sacrifice in order to forgive people in the first place, you quickly realize that Jesus did not have to die, and that his death as a sacrifice makes no sense. Number 2. Fulfilling God's Justice Another way apologists will defend the idea that Jesus had to die is by saying that Jesus' death was a fulfillment of God's justice. After all, God is perfectly just, and justice requires punishment. But, because God loves us so much, he chose to inflict the punishment on, well, himself. And this is why Christianity is the perfect combination of love and justice. Jesus' death fulfills the requirements of justice, while also demonstrating God's profound love for his children. At the very center of the Christian story, is a story of a God who comes and fulfills the requirements of justice in order to show us mercy. That's the whole story of Jesus in a nutshell. God is the holy, righteous judge of the universe. Therefore, he can't be indifferent to sin. But what God has done is even better. You see, he's offered the death of his son, Jesus Christ, who lived a perfect, sinless life as an act of love towards us, but also as an act of justice. The satisfaction of divine justice is a necessary condition for a divine pardon. Otherwise, God's justice would be compromised. And so the atonement serves to allow God to be fully loving and merciful 
and yet fully just. The problem with this picture is that justice, as we all use the word, requires that the person who committed the crime is punished, not someone else. If someone was convicted of murder, for example, but their innocent friend volunteered to go to jail for them, we would not consider that justice simply because someone went to jail. We would not say that justice had been served. Likewise, if Bill Gates had paid BP's fines for the 2010 Deepwater Horizon disaster, we would not have considered that justice. It is not justice to punish someone for a crime they did not commit and to allow the actual perpetrator to go free. This is important because, according to Christianity, we are the ones who have committed crimes against God, not Jesus. So it makes no sense to say that Jesus' death was a fulfillment of justice. Scapegoating is not justice. Punishing an innocent man is not justice. The death of Jesus was not justice. At this point, some apologists will argue that the death of Jesus is an example of justice, but it's a different kind of justice. It's divine justice, which is different from earthly justice in some way. This is shifting the goalposts. It's changing your definition of justice as soon as you realize that the word doesn't mean what you want it to mean. Justice, as apologists themselves would use the word in any other context, requires that the perpetrator is punished. When you murder someone, you go to jail. When BP spills 210 million gallons of oil, they pay the fine. But when humans sin against God, Jesus suffers the punishment? That's not justice. You don't get to special plead your own version of justice in this one context simply so you can hold on to the word. I'm just as important as him. It's just that the kind of importance I have, it doesn't matter if I don't do it. Number three, vicarious liability. In response to these concerns about justice and punishment, some apologists will cite vicarious liability arguing that we already do punish people for crimes they did not commit, such as when we punish employers for what their employees do on the job. This would seem to allow for Jesus to be punished for the sins of humanity, even though he didn't actually sin. It would make no sense at all to punish my daughter, my three-year-old daughter, for sins that I myself have committed. Yes. So how is that possible? In Western systems of justice, there is a very widespread and largely uncontroversial principle of vicarious liability. Employers can be held vicariously liable for wrongs committed by their employees in the course of their duties, so that the employer will be held criminally liable for the acts of the employee, even though the employer did not do them. Um, indeed, he is utterly blameless in the matter. He is not held guilty for other acts such as negligence or complicity in the crime. He is guilty without being culpable. This certainly does sound like a refutation of my argument about justice. But we need to ask the question, why do we hold employers liable for what their employees do? And whatever the reason is, does it make sense to apply it to Jesus and human sin? So, do we hold employers liable because they had malicious intent? Is it because the employer should have known better than to hire this person? Is it because the employer is some kind of legal guardian to its employees? No. We hold employers liable for what their employees do because, to put it bluntly, it forces employers to participate in law enforcement. We want to prevent specific crimes that happen behind closed doors in a corporate environment. But we can't station police officers in every office, so the only practical solution is to coerce employers to enforce these laws on behalf of the state. Vicarious liability of employers is not about justice. It's about pragmatism and incentives. This is why we hold employers liable for what their employees do. And it makes no sense to apply this to the death of Jesus and the sins of humanity. 
If Jesus was punished for our sins, like how we hold employers vicariously liable for their employees, then it would follow that God can't actually see us sinning, and that Jesus should have been watching us more closely and preventing our sinful behavior, which is not at all what Christians like Craig believe. Jesus is not supposed to be responsible for keeping us in line or reporting our crimes to God, nor was he meant to be coerced into doing so by the threat of crucifixion. Our relationship with Jesus is nothing like our relationship with employers in this respect, so it makes no sense to hold Jesus vicariously liable for our behavior. Vicarious liability is a terrible explanation for why Jesus had to die. Number 4. Legal Fictions Another argument for why Jesus had to die is that Jesus was guilty by virtue of a legal fiction. One example of legal fictions that Craig cites is the practice of legally holding ships responsible for the smuggled cargo they contain, instead of the crew or the owners. In a similar way, he argues, it's possible that Jesus died because God chose to use a legal fiction of holding Jesus responsible for sin instead of us. What you could say is, God adopts the legal fiction that Christ has committed these crimes and is therefore liable for them, and therefore he punishes him for these crimes. And the use of legal fictions in Western systems of justice is again a widespread and indispensable feature of Western systems of justice. And in the same way, God could adopt, if he wanted to, this legal fiction that Christ had committed these sins, and therefore he was legally liable for them. This certainly seems like a plausible answer to why Jesus might have been punished for our sins. But as before, we need to ask why we invent these kinds of legal fictions. And whatever the reason is, does it make sense to apply this reasoning to the case of human sin? As it turns out, Craig actually comes very close to answering the first question in his example of a legal fiction, but he is very careful to not explore how applicable it is to human sin, because it's not at all applicable. At the beginning of the 19th century, uh, there were slave ships who were carrying illegal cargo uh, and running the blockades, and when they were stopped, the captains and the crews would blame the ship owners. When the owners were confronted, they would present these innocent manifests of what was supposedly on board and said they had no idea of the illegal activity of the captains and crews. Well, what the courts decided is that it is the ship itself who is legally liable for the crime and is therefore criminally liable to pay the compensation. And I think this is exactly right. We invented these legal fictions as a necessity of ignorance. We don't know who the smuggler is, but clearly it must be someone connected to the ship. So we charge the ship with the crime in order to indirectly punish whoever is actually guilty and to dissuade future smugglers from thinking they can get away with it by feigning ignorance. It's a very sloppy shotgun approach with questionable legal and moral grounding in my opinion, but this is why we invented these kinds of legal fictions. So, does this kind of legal fiction make sense for God to use in the case of human sin? No, it makes no sense at all. God knows exactly who is guilty of which sins, so he can punish the guilty sinners directly instead of punishing something connected to them. Furthermore, even if God didn't know who was guilty of what, guilty sinners were not really harmed by the death of Jesus, so it didn't actually achieve indirect punishment of the guilty sinners. Also, God is not threatening to kill Jesus again if we continue to sin, so this legal fiction doesn't even dissuade future sinning. And finally, just as we would charge a ship with a crime, couldn't God likewise charge an inanimate object with our crimes? He could at least choose an object that we actually care about, like our houses or something. There is simply no reason to choose Jesus as the target of a legal fiction. Legal fictions cannot explain any part of why Jesus had to die. Number 5. 
repaying a debt. Another way apologists will defend the idea that Jesus had to die is by arguing that we owe a debt to God and that this debt must be repaid. And for some reason, the currency of God's bank is a blood sacrifice. The wages of sin is death. Therefore, Jesus had to die in order to repay our debt. Only a man so perfect and sinless, only a man of such a grand nature as that of God himself, could be valuable enough to repay the debt humanity owed. If you come to my house and you break a lamp and you owe me, say, $50, I can free you of that debt, but that debt doesn't disappear. Rather than coming out of your account, it comes out of mine. I cover that debt and take it upon myself. Well, this is what God does in forgiving us. Because God is just, there must be a payment, so to speak, for the wrong things that we do. But because God is loving, he takes our debt into his own account and pays for it himself. The first problem with this answer is that it raises another major question. Why is the repayment for this injury to God, the wages of sin, death? Why does something need to physically die before God can forgive sins? Couldn't God have not done it that way? Sir, wouldn't it be better if we didn't do that instead of doing it? This kind of payment only serves to make God's system more confusing and more arbitrary. It raises an even more intractable question than it answers. The second problem with the idea that Jesus' death was some kind of payment is the fact that, in any other debt, the payment of said debt does not require that we first praise the person who paid it. If I owe a debt, and if someone else pays it for me, my creditor does not first require that I express gratitude to the person who paid it. My creditor considers the debt paid and moves on. They got their money back, they're happy, end of transaction. If Jesus' death was a payment for a debt, then the debt should now be paid. That's how debts work. There shouldn't be anything more for us to say or do. Now, perhaps the apologist might say that Jesus is simply offering to pay our debt, but that he won't actually do it until we first thank him for it. But this opens an even bigger can of worms. Why does Jesus' offer to pay our debt come with the price tag of singing his praise? Is Jesus not an altruist? Does he not simply pay the debt because he loves us? He wants praise and acknowledgement first? That seems incredibly narcissistic and unloving. When President Donald Trump refused to give federal aid to states whose governors were not nice to him, and when he delayed the second round of stimulus checks in order to put his name on them, people condemned these behaviors as callous and narcissistic. What kind of leader withholds life-saving resources in exchange for praise and acknowledgement? And yet... This is exactly what Jesus is doing if his offer to pay our debts comes at the cost of singing his praise. Jesus loves you more than you can ever imagine, but he won't pay your debt altruistically? That's not how a loving person behaves. And didn't Jesus himself say to not make a big deal about your good deeds? Do not pray in public like the hypocrites, and do not let the left hand know what the right is doing? Why doesn't Jesus take his own advice and pay our debts quietly without expecting praise in return? If this is something Jesus expects of us, if this is supposed to be a moral virtue, then why does Jesus do the exact opposite by asking us to sing his praise before he will repay our debt? If Jesus' death was payment for a debt, then the debt should be paid, and there should be nothing more for us to do. And if Jesus is simply offering to pay our debt, then this would seem to make Jesus a stingy narcissist who disobeys his own teachings. Neither of these debt-based answers can justify the idea that Jesus had to die. Number 6. Jesus Bore Our Punishment In conjunction with many of the previous apologetics for why Jesus had to die, many apologists will say that Jesus bore the punishment we deserve. We deserve pain and suffering for our debts and our crimes, but Jesus suffered our penalty for us. He bore the punishment we deserve. And since God is rich in mercy, he has in the person of Christ walked among us, um, stepped into this world, and on the cross he absorbed the judgment and the wrath that we deserved. 
But there's an obvious problem here. Jesus did not bear the punishment we deserve. The punishment we deserve is eternal conscious torment in hell, or irreversible annihilation if you're an annihilationist. Jesus, however, only suffered one day of physical abuse on earth, followed by two days of being dead, and then he got to be alive again in heaven with God for the rest of time. That is not our punishment. It's a completely different punishment. If Jesus was supposed to bear our punishment, then he should have gone to hell forever or been annihilated forever. But he didn't, and he wasn't. Whether you are an annihilationist Christian or a hellfire Christian, Jesus clearly did not bear our punishment. Jesus bore something different. But true to form, William Lane Craig has a solution which almost works if you don't really think about it. To explain how Jesus did bear our punishment, Craig has proposed that the horrible and potentially infinite suffering we deserve was somehow compressed into the brief period of time that Jesus suffered being beaten and crucified. If he was only dead for three days, how does that, how does that work? Mathematically. The suffering that the damned in hell will experience was compressed into that brief period of time. A person who has a hangnail and suffers for eternity from that will experience infinite suffering. But at any point in time, his suffering will not be very intense. But if you compress all of that infinite suffering into a short period of time, it would be unbearable. And that's what Christ suffered. This explanation is demonstrably non-biblical if you believe that the Bible teaches eternal conscious torment. The suffering that some people deserve in hell is said to be extremely horrible, even on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. The rich man and Lazarus being cast into a fire that does not die, each of these descriptions is at least as bad as what Jesus suffered. Jesus suffered a lot, sure, but to argue that the potentially infinite suffering of billions of people in hell can be exchanged for a single day of one man being beaten and crucified is completely implausible and, frankly, intellectually dishonest. If Craig honestly believes that these two amounts of suffering are equivalent, then he would have to conclude that the moment-to-moment -moment suffering of a person in hell is practically non-existent, and arguably not even as bad as the suffering we experience on Earth, as he himself implied but did not commit to with his example of a hangnail that lasts forever. So the question remains, why did Jesus have to die? Clearly, it was not so he could bear our punishment. Number 7. A Demonstration of Love and Sin Another argument for why Jesus had to die is that the death of Jesus, and specifically the brutality of it, was meant as a demonstration of God's love for humanity and or as a demonstration of how bad our sin truly is. The death of Jesus was not intended to change how the world functions or how God feels about us. Rather, the death of Jesus was intended to change how we feel about God. It was a way for God to show us how much he loves us and or how horrible our sin is. He chose to do it through this horrible, gruesome passion of Christ for good reasons. Namely, it serves to show the depth of human depravity and sin. And secondly, it serves to show the extremity of God's love for man. Christ's passion and death showed us the extent to which God would go to reconcile us to himself, and thereby serves to enkindle in us, in turn, a a flame of love for God. Let's first address the idea that the death of Jesus was meant to demonstrate God's love. Vincent van Gogh, the world-renowned painter, famously cut off part of his ear and gifted it to a young woman, supposedly to show how much he loved her. On paper, you can kind of understand how this might make sense. It demonstrated that he loved her more than he valued his bodily integrity. In practice, however, I think we can all understand why the woman was disturbed instead of flattered. 
Torturing and mutilating yourself is not something we consider to be an indication of love. Instead, we consider it to be an indication of masochism and obsession, like what a stalker would do. It does not make us think that the person loves us, it makes us think, gee, if he's willing to do that to himself, imagine what he might do to me if I don't reciprocate. Hmm. The idea that God killed Jesus as a demonstration of love is clearly unworkable. This is not the kind of behavior which demonstrates love, it's the kind of behavior which demonstrates obsession and mental illness. Jesus' death on the cross is not a good way for God to show us that he loves us, any more than chopping off your ear is a good way to show a young woman that you love her. But there's another problem with this explanation, and it's a problem for both the love and sin arguments. If the brutal death of Jesus was meant to show how much God loves us, or how bad our sin is, then why wasn't the death of Jesus more brutal? If God really loves us as profoundly as an infinite being can love, and if our sins against God really are the worst evils that exist, then why wasn't Jesus killed in the most horrific way in history? That's what you'd expect if God really loved us more than any other being can love, or if sin really is as bad as apologists claim. Compared to the depth of God's love and the extremity of human sin, the crucifixion of Jesus was child's play. He didn't even last a full day for God's sake. Jesus got the easy version of crucifixion. History is full of horrific execution techniques that are far worse than crucifixion. So why didn't God put Jesus through one of those? Does God love us as much as crucifixion, but not as much as flaying Jesus alive? Is our sin as bad as crucifixion, but not as bad as that thing where you saw a person in half from their crotch to their head while they hang upside down? If the death of Jesus really was meant to show how much God loves us, or how horrible our sins are, then the method of execution should have been much worse and much more unique. No matter how you spin this one, the idea that God killed Jesus to show how much he loves us, or to show how bad our sin is, is simply ridiculous. Number 8. Satisfaction Another explanation for why Jesus had to die is that God demands satisfaction for the injury we've caused him. Another theory would be the so-called satisfaction theory. And according to this model, we have besmirched God's honor. You insulted my honor! I, you know what now? I demand satisfaction! Oh. And thereby we owe God an infinite debt of compensation for having wronged him, which we are incapable of paying. He has stolen my honor, and his debts must be paid. Unlike the other explanations we've examined, I think the satisfaction argument actually does make sense. Redirected aggression is a real thing. If we are angry at someone, we sometimes take it out on someone else. Even some animals do this within their social groups. The only problem with this explanation is, we're supposed to be talking about God. Is this really the God that Christians preach about? Is this really the God Christians believe in? A God who is so angered by every insult to his honor that he takes out his frustrations on an innocent man? If the satisfaction explanation has any truth to it, then God is no different from an angry child who can't control himself. Instead of simply forgiving people, instead of being the bigger man, he feels the need to lash out at someone else who didn't do anything wrong. Is this really the loving God I've heard so much about? A God who wants to hurt someone because we hurt him? I don't think so. Nor do I think it can be honestly argued that such a being would actually be loving and benevolent. That's not how a loving person behaves. What sort of God demands his son die so that his honor can be restored? What sort of God is so filled with wrath that he demands that his son die so that he can be satisfied? Besides, if Jesus is supposed to be God, that raises another question. How satisfying is it to take out your anger on yourself? Does that really create satisfaction? 
If Jesus is God, then the crucifixion of Jesus was basically just a case of God slitting his wrists like an unstable teenager, taking out his frustration on himself. Again, I ask, is this really the God that Christians believe in? Some kind of emo God who wants to get even with us, who lashes out at innocent people, and who self-harms in search of satisfaction? I don't think so. I don't think any believing Christian would seriously affirm that this is the God they believe in, nor do I think it is intellectually honest to believe that such a God is loving and merciful. The satisfaction explanation, while superficially plausible, makes no sense when applied to the God of Christianity. Number 9. Conclusion There is simply no coherent explanation for why Jesus had to die. The explanations given by Christian apologists are certainly well-crafted, painting a beautiful picture of love and justice which makes us feel cared for. But these poetic descriptions don't provide coherent answers. They are specifically crafted to gloss over their lack of substance. Their purpose is simply to ease the emotional discomfort of Christians who, understandably, find it hard to reconcile the torture and killing of an innocent man with the loving God they want to believe in. No matter how you slice it, the death of Jesus accomplished nothing. Jesus did not have to die. The actual reason why Jesus did die, in contrast, is rather simple. As far as we can tell, based on the beliefs of Jews in first century Palestine, and based on Jesus' recorded teachings examined against this cultural backdrop, not only did Jesus not have to die, Jesus probably did not plan to die. Jesus planned for the Jewish apocalypse to happen, wherein God would destroy the enemies of Israel, install Jesus as the king of all nations, and transform the earth into God's perfect kingdom. But when the Jewish apocalypse didn't happen, Jesus was executed by the Romans for making such a seditious prediction. Calling yourself a king and promising the destruction of the empire is a surefire way to get yourself crucified. Jesus' prediction of the apocalypse failed, and his prediction got him killed by the Romans. The death of Jesus had no deeper purpose. It was an accident. And his followers have been desperately trying to invent a purpose for it ever since. Thank you for watching, subscribe if you want to see more, and if you really enjoyed this video, you can support this channel on Patreon on a per video basis.